Hello everyone, my name is Danae. And I'm Andrea. And today we're going to be talking about the history of colorism and its early depictions of it in old Hollywood. This is our first episode of our three segment series covering colorism in the media and what you can do to change that. But then our second episode, it will be hosted by Louise and Sarah Paul, and it will cover how colorism manifests directly, differently for men and women, for people of different racial ethnic communities and the implications of this. Our last and final episode will be hosted by Helena and Sub. Um, it will look at how colorism is upheld by the media, not only in how they represent people of different complexions, but also in terms of different treatment people will face within the industry. So jumping right into it, let's first define what colorism is. According to the Webster Dictionary, colorism is the prejudice or discrimination, especially within a racial or ethnic group, favoring people with lighter skin over those with darker skin. So, Andrea, have you ever experienced colorism? Firsthand directed towards me, I don't think so, but I've definitely heard of like things where people will talk about like dating preferences and it's always like preferring people with lighter skin tones and usually it's because of like negative stereotypes they have attached to people of darker skin yeah for me it's always been because I'm darker skin so it'd be like oh you're pretty for a dark skin girl like why can't you just say I'm pretty <laughs> in general yeah. but Colorism is very different from racism and that racism is a belief that race is a fundamental determinant of human traits and capacities and that the racial differences produce an inherent superiority, sorry, <laughs> You're fine. Um, of a particular race. And this is also from Webster Dictionary. So in other words, racism seeks to categorize people and races based on skin tone and other physical characteristics and use systems, policies, and ideas to create unequal outcomes and limit the rights of people. Um, in particular, people of color. Colorism is also a product of and functions alongside of racism, which helps to promote the idea of white being a superior race. Colorism is also the dynamic in which one is a member of a racial or ethnic minority, but their proximity to whiteness is treated and seen as more favorable or viable within and outside their group. And even though one may still experience racism for belonging to a racial minority group, so colorism in America specifically can be traced back to the antebellum era where white enslavers would commonly force enslaved women to have sex with them. This resulted in children with lighter complexions and led to differential treatment between light skin and dark skin people. White colonists showed preferential treatment towards those with lighter skin because they were typically related to them and because their proximity to whiteness viewing them as superior in comparison to their dark skin counterparts for having quote unquote white blood in them. White enslavers also endorsed this hierarchy by relegating light skinned people to indoor domestic work and selling them at higher prices, while dark skinned people were giving harsh field labor and sold for less because they were seen as less valuable. This treatment, of course, did not go unnoticed by those who were enslaved, and according to Antoinette Landor, mixed lighter skinned people were conscious of the distinctions between themselves and dark skinned people and believed that their white blood did indeed make them superior. Along with color differences in occupational status, the similarities between white and those of mixed race in physical appearance, speech, dress, and customary behavior reinforced this attitude in the enslaved population as a whole. End quote. The internalization of these messages perpetrated by the white colonizers had long-lasting effects within the Black community. 
After the institution of slavery died off in the U.S., light-skinned people collectively created societies, churches, and other organizations which denied entry to those of darker complexions, along with other determining factors which indicated one's lack of proximity to whiteness. Various tests were used to determine who could join a society, such as whether someone's hair was straight enough to run a comb through it, and in blue vein societies, if one couldn't see the blue of your veins beneath your skin, you were considered too dark to join. There's also the infamous brown paper bag test, where if someone was darker than a brown paper bag, they also weren't allowed entry. Um, me personally, I never heard of the blue vein societies. So that was interesting to hear about but there's been many many studies about the brown paper bag test and it's actually crazy because young girls would think that they're not beautiful or valuable just because they're darker skin and it's like you're a little girl thinking about that so imagine how that's going to affect you when you get older yeah and it just shows how long like the effects of this have lasted like people will talk about it like oh it's in the past or like oh it's not as big of an issue and like even though maybe you can say like there has been improvement definitely it still definitely has very real life impacts on people's like quality of life like their mental health I also agree to that but it has improved but they could do better for sure. much better <laughs> But, like, I also didn't know about, like, the Blue Vein Society. That was only something I found out, like, after doing research about it. The brown paper bag test, I feel like almost everyone knows. But, yeah, I didn't know about the the Blue Vein Society thing. I think because, you know, I don't know. They give you certain information to learn about in school. Mm -hmm. And the Blue Vein Society was, like, crazy. So they just didn't incorporate that into the history books yeah the way they like whitewash history too is kind of because then people aren't aware of like these issues and the things they internalize like how am I trying to explain it like you internalize all of these things but because you're not educated of like what in history has influenced your beliefs you kind of just ignorantly go along like continuing to perpetuate like negative stereotypes and yeah I don't know if that makes sense but no it makes sense it also goes to show like when things don't affect you personally you just tend to ignore it because it doesn't affect you so even though you're in somebody else or how you're treating somebody else even though you don't consciously like know that you're doing it mm -hmm. you don't try to fix it because you don't see an issue with it because it doesn't affect you Exactly. Okay. Generally speaking, light-skinned Black Americans were also given prefer preferred treatment within the greater society. Being given a wide range of job opportunities, which led to light-skinned majority in the upper echelons of Black society. Further reinforcing the hierarchy and messages put forth by the white man. Skin color has always been a driving force in the privileges one obtains throughout their lifetime. Lighter skin and Black Americans are generally linked with a more positive characteristics and children are more likely to associate negative traits with dark skinned males and positive traits with light skinned males. Colorism is learned at a young age and carries on through every stage of life. There has been many studies that found significant prefer preference for lighter skin in children from their preteen years to their teenage years. In a 2007 study led by Stephens and Few Demo, the male preteens viewed the lighter skin African-American woman as more beautiful than a woman with darker skin. Preteen girls in the same study reported that women with darker skin are beautiful, but overall concluded that the lighter skinned women are more desirable especially in relationships. So 
Before moving on to old Hollywood, it's also important to note that colorism is not a purely American problem, but a global phenomenon. So as a quick example, Latin America, where my family is from, also faces deep-seated issues of racism and colorism. In the 19th century, many Caribbean and Latin American countries pushed the idea of mestizaje to create homogeneity throughout countries by celebrating racial mixing. This idea, however, also centered blanqueamento, or whitening of the general population. According to Helena Safa, who examined the indigenous and Afro-descendant movements in Latin America, in Mexico, mestizaje was embodied in the paradigm of indigenismo, which dominated Mexican state policy from the time of the 1910 revolution and cultivated a respect for indigenous roots, but at the same time negated self-determination for the native population by equating progress with assimilation to European ways. During that same time period in Colombia, there was the project of La Nación Mestiza, the mixed nation, which again centered on mestizaje, the mixing of races, while also centering whiteness as the ultimate goal. In an excerpt from a journal article writing about mestizaje in contemporary Colombia, it is noted that there was no place or future for the indigenous population in this project, except as a legacy from the past, as a stain that had to be cleaned, and in the republic of liberal dreams, it had to disappear. In Argentina from 1860 to 1914, this was known as the Blanqueamento period. During this time, Argentinian politicians and so-called intellectuals glorified Europe and sought to embody European nations by whitening its population and displacing people of color. Presidents such as Juan Bautista and Domingo Fautisno encouraged European immigration to the country. So great was the number of European immigrants, over 4 million, that later on, people wrote in newspapers how, quote, the black race is losing in the mixture its primitive color. It becomes gray, it dissolves, it lightens. An African tree is producing white flowers, end quote. These sentiments in Latin America have been internalized so heavily that phrases like pelo malo and mejorar la raza are commonplace. Pelo malo translates to bad hair, referring to those with curly and tightly coiled hair textures meant to express anti-Black sentiments. Mejorar la raza means to better the race, and is something parents or relatives will say to their children, advising them to marry and date someone white or at least lighter in skin tone than they are. Just like here in the U.S., this can all be traced back to the brutalization and enslavement of indigenous and black people where white colonizers first sowed the seeds of racism and colorism, planting this idea of whiteness as being superior, equating it with intelligence, progress, and all things good. Of course, politics and policies aren't the only way in which the, these ideas are spread and internalized by the general population. The media also plays a great role in reinforcing these ideas. In old American Hollywood, many stereotypes arose from racist ideology, such as the mammy figure, which refers to a nurturing partner who is always smiling and willing to please, Figures like Uncle Tom, the Sambo, Sapphire Jezebel, and brute caricatures. Most of these stereotypes were portrayed by dark-skinned actors or actors in blackface. One of the most prominent examples of colorism being depicted in Hollywood is from the 1959 remake of Imitation of Life. The movie centers on a single struggling widow, Laura, and her daughter, Susie who offers a single Black mother, Annie, to become her housekeeper. Annie has a light-skinned daughter named Sarah, who passes for white. 
And a core storyline in the movie revolves around how Sarah resents being associated with her mother because her mother is dark skin and thus any association with her mom exposes the fact that she is not white. Sarah tries to cut off ties and distance herself from her mother when she gets older so she can fit into white society. Meanwhile, throughout the movie, Annie's actor still very much embodies the mammy stereotype. Quote, during slavery, the mammy caricature was posited as proof that Blacks, in this case, Black women, were content, even happy, being enslaved. Her wide grin, hearty laughter, and loyal servitude were offered as evidence of the supposed humanity of the institution of slavery. End quote. This caricature carried over on screen where typically dark-skinned women were shown in side roles or generally some type of position of servitude, like being a maid, housekeeper, nanny, etc., and were heavily desexualized and shown as being content while serving white families. So to summarize, while Sarah's character did experience racism in the movie, she also recognized that her ability to pass as white worked in her favor to climb the social ladder and receive better treatment. And on top of that, she saw her mother as someone who was holding her back from achieving this. While her mother's character, played by Juanita Moore, was depicted as a content housekeeper who tries desperately to stick by her daughter's side. It's also crazy that, like, with colorism, the mammy is always, like, a dark-skinned woman, but they also always choose like a thicker heavier like woman rather than a skinny or skin woman because mm -hmm. really what they're trying to do is like depict darker skin as being undesirable which also overlaps a lot into like this whole idea that being fat is undesirable mm -hmm. so like those two issues kind of like overlapping so you're depicting like both dark skin and fat people as being undesirable and then you're showing like lighter skin skinny or like hourglass or whatever as being like the epitome of beauty so yeah so since the introduction of african-american actors in film colorism has slowly become a big problem that needs to be addressed so within american films it is evident that it is doing a poor job with its representation, especially with African-American women to be exact. Dark-skinned women, they do not give the best light with the movies or film in, film in general. So let's just say a young girl is watching her favorite Disney Channel movie. Do you think she's likely to see someone like herself? Or what about a teenager watching the latest teen drama? Like, is she likely to see herself represented in a positive light? If the two girls had lighter skin, or maybe they were biracial, then maybe they would see themselves in a positive light. But if both of the girls are dark skinned African-American females, then they're not gonna see themselves represented in the best way within television and TV will make it like they will put all the harmful stereotypes in there. Okay, dark skinned women are portrayed in the media that relates to the harmful, harmful stereotypes set against them that in no way represents the majority of dark skinned women. So according to Newman Bergman, she's a writer and a broadcaster. She stated how dark-skinned African-American women in film are rarely seen as a popular or pretty love interest. Instead, they are assigned to roles that involve loud, unlovable, and more sassy roles. Overall, this type of representation and stereotypes, as one can imagine, has a long-lasting impact on the way people are still treated and viewed today. One of the most powerful ways to combat, combat these issues though, is through education and awareness, especially given how many people are unaware of colorism and its impacts. Things such as the critical race theory, or CRT, is a school of thought that explores 
and critiques American history, society, and institutions of power, including the government and legal systems. From a race-based perspective, and plays an important role in education and educating people about the history of racism and colorism and its impacts on individuals and systemic levels. Some organizations you can support that advocate for CRT are Learning for Justice, the Zion Education Project, and the hashtag Truth Be Told campaign. And that wraps up our first episode of the colorism umbrella thank you for listening and don't forget to comment down below thank you